Magic Mike Show, where you hear the experts speak. The Magic Mike Show, tune into the show every week. The Magic Mike Show, you can trust the show is the bomb because it's being brought to you by RacingDudes.com. What's up, everybody? I'm Magic. And I'm Mike. And this is the Magic Mike Show, episode 536. Mr. Samich. Uh, what is it? Florida Derby Week. Huzzah! I know. it's uh, it's we're, we're playing with gasoline right now, my friends. We've got uh, Florida Derby Weekend, uh, Arkansas Derby Weekend coming up. We've just had Louisiana Derby and Jeff Ruby Weekend, which we're going to talk about. It's Dubai World Cup Weekend coming up as well. For those of you who like to play the international races or at least wake up with the Cup of Joe and some good old horse racing overseas. Then the week after that, Mike, it's Bluegrass Sandy Derby Wood Memorial Day. It's like we're we're right in the middle of the eye of the storm here. Oh yeah, we're 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 rocking and rolling now. Starting to see some glimpses of what horses I think we we like here. I mean, obviously we're going to talk Catching Freedom today, a horse that we both have been high on since the draft. Really, where we were kind of bummed we didn't end up getting him in the draft. Ends up winning the Louisiana Derby. Uh, the style, the running style, we're gonna. That's an interesting one that we're gonna have to go go over a little bit. Um, and, and the pace of this Derby is shaping up to be interesting too because. I don't see a ton of speed horses that right now are in the gate if you look at that top 20. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out as well. Um, but it, I love this part of the season. Florida Derby, traditionally one of my favorite races of the year. I'm excited for that race this weekend. And then the bluegrass can be very interesting seeing horses like Sierra Leone come back. How do they do there? It's a, a normal Chad Brown route to get to the Derby. What's going to happen there? Um, and then I'm excited to talk about these two preps. I thought we saw some some pretty nice efforts in both of the Phillies prep. So I want to talk about those two, especially heading to the Kentucky Oaks. And then uh, obviously the catching freedom and Anna Marie of it all. Like, what do you do with these two horses and the style they're going to have in the Derby? Yeah, well, all that to talk about. I already see some questions popping up. So uh, if you're watching us live, let us know what questions you have here. We'll be uh, sure to bring them up here on the show. But Louisiana Derby, Jeff Ruby Stakes, Fairgrounds Oaks, and the Bourbonette Oaks. I almost can't remember that. Let's get into it right up. My first race, we're going to talk about the Grade 2 Louisiana Derby Million Dollar Purse Mount of 3 16 the co-longest prep of the entire series. And, uh, yeah, I see people talking about Honor Marie, but Honor Marie ran a good second. Catching Freedom last to first gets the job done and uh, super impressive. By far the best he has looked so far. Pratt Daddy got him fixed. <laughs> he did. He did. And the trip got him fixed a little bit, too. I mean, it's interesting. Uh, it was dead last and was able to make the run to first on Marie, second to last at the uh, at the half mile point. So both of the horses that that one came from off the pace, not shocking when we talked about some of the speed horses and some of the questions we have considering, you know, track for Phantom breaking from the 12 post. Was he really going to like the distance? What was the early pace going to look like? The pace wasn't too fast, but the distance clearly came into play there for track Phantom later in the race. Look. Uh, watching this back and watching the Risen Star back, the difference with catching freedom when he was on the outside versus in the middle of horses was just dramatic to watch. He clearly likes to have room on the outside. And I mention this not because, you know, he's going to be coming from the back of the pack in the Derby. And we've seen the last two years horses have success coming from the back of the pack in the Derby. He's going to have to be the widest of them all to possibly run his best based on what we've seen in these last two now. We talked about catching freedom being green last time. Maybe he was just sharper. Maybe he doesn't have that greenness in him. But I still have some concern with him having to weave through horses and be able to make that run versus having to go all the way on the outside and make that run. What did, what did you think when you saw this performance? I was super impressed with once he got going uh, that he was able to close as well as he did. And you look at the final time there. So they go a mile and three sixteenths. So from the mile to the finish line, those final three sixteenths, he averaged under six and a third for it was 6.26 seconds for each of the 16th. Like for him to be going that fast at the end of a race like that, I said it on the live show, he's going to have the highest Brisnet late pace rating. And that is something that Saratoga Slim always based his Derby thesis projections on is which horses do you know are going to be coming late. And I agree with you that he being outside of horses seemed to really help him out here. But Look what Fabian Pratt did with Angel of Empire last year. He looked like an Angel of Empire clone almost the way he was running uh, for All Ball Family Stable. Same silk, same jockey, same trainer, same race that he gets the win in. 
So I thought it was very, very impressive. Uh, I know Aaron Haltzman wasn't nearly as high on him, but I was very impressed with his progression here. What do you think catching freedom breaks from the gate at? What's the odds? Well, we still have a few races left to go, of course. The Arkansas Derby, you could have the Florida Derby. If you have Fierceness, Timberlake, come out of that race with winning and looking very strong. Conquest War, even if he wins the Florida Derby, they might end up being the favorite. But I think catching freedom, you're looking at about three to one, four to one on him. I would expect a little higher than four to one. I mean, we talked about 25 to one in the future pool before this race. Obviously, that is uh, evaporated. You're not getting anywhere near that. I do think he's going to be single digits, though. I think this is going to be your third or fourth choice. I, I, well, I guess it, if I think fierceness is going to run pretty well on Saturday, and I think fierceness is going to end up being your favorite heading into the Kentucky Derby just because of what we saw at the Breeders' Cup and what I expect from him on Saturday. And if, if that's the case, uh, I would expect he's your favorite. I agree. Timberlake could be a short price. We'll see if he can put back-to-back races together. I still have big concerns about Timberlake getting a mile and a quarter. So we'll see if yeah. uh, if he's able to do that long term. Uh, but catching freedom, I think, is going to be somewhere in, and I agree with what Christopher's saying, somewhere in that seven to one, eight to one range now is your your third, fourth choice on the board. And I did. Uh, uh, Shadi brings up Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone, if if he wins the Bluegrass, I think he would end up being your favorite for the for the Kentucky Derby. But uh, I also don't think that. I don't know that I'm going to play him in the bluegrass stakes. So we'll talk about that uh, next weekend. But yeah. uh, catching freedom, I was uh, able to get him in the last Derby future pool is 14 to 1, 17 to 1, something like that. So that was a nice $5 well spent after watching what he did here. Uh, Chris Maiello needed Honor Marie for a big one. Curtis Manlo, Honor Marie about got me paid. Listen, Mike and I own Honor Marie in fantasy, and this is our only hope. Uh, we were very happy with that oh, second yeah. place effort. They're very happy. I, I thought Anne Marie ran really well. Um, I actually thought Anne Marie had a chance to win this race for a good part of the stretch because Anne Marie was ahead of Catching Freedom, and Catching Freedom ends up just running him down as the two just kind of enveloped everybody else. I mean, clearly the best two horses in this race. Uh, it's interesting because, like, I, you know, we're talking about Sierra Leone and, and Catching Freedom, Anne Marie. These are just dead closers, right? And so, where do you rank them? Who do you think is the most athletic? When we look at Mage last year, the difference between Mage and Angel of Empire and some of the other closers that couldn't get there was Mage's athleticism. Um, I'm not sure who the most athletic horse is that we're seeing that is a deep closer so far in this field. It's going to be interesting to see how you decipher that. I thought there's a really good step forward for Anna Marie, though. We've we've heard from uh, the trainer that, you know, look, Anna Marie wants every bit of additional distance. I completely agree with that. We'll see what Anna Marie can do with the, the additional distance in the Derby. Uh, if you go back, you watch the Risen Star, Anna Marie was not interested in running for half of that race like a good half mile was kind of goofing around and then kind of got to close some ground in the stretch we saw a much more focused Anna Marie today or on Saturday so it's not out of the question that Anna Marie takes another step forward out of this as well and it feels like if you're high on catching freedom you kind of have to like Anna Marie's race in this spot as well because I, I thought they got very similar trips they ended up with very similar times uh, if you look at their how they came home they were very similar in that aspect as well so uh, to me both of these two horses are I'll call it legitimate threats to at least hit the board in the Derby at this point. Fully agree with you on that point. And not just because we have Anna Marie, but that was the Anna Marie that we saw when he was at his best as a two-year-old was he was last to first or almost last, but he really has a super solid kick that I think continues to be underrated based off. of. I mean, we've seen some amazing closures. We've catching freedom here. Sierra Leone has shown us multiple times that he can close like a freight train. So he's the third best closer in this crop, but, I think the best three horses in this field or, or in the Derby field potentially might be closer. So uh, speaking of third, let's talk about the third place finisher because there's three horses that impressed me out of this race. The number 11 Tuscan Gold is the third one that did so. Uh, going right up from the maiden ranks into this spot, not an easy position. Has to break from the second to farthest outside post 11. Now, well, I guess it's post 10 with a scratch, but still not an easy thing to do. Got knocked around a little bit in the stretch. Still finished on strong, got third. What did you think about Tuscan Gold? Uh, I thought Tuscan Gold was was took a huge step forward and, and, and did it at the right time, right? Uh, maybe enough points to be able to make the Derby gate. We'll see what happens there. We'll see if Brown tries to wheel it back quickly. I'd be very surprised if he did. Um, but this was a horse that was closer to the pace, and you mentioned kind of the, the awkward trip early as well. So if you're I, – I, I often – when I'm picking a Derby horse, I want that stalker-style trip, right? And – uh, the first two that we talked about, Catching Freedom and Anne-Marie, never getting that stocking style trip. They're coming from the back. Tuscan Gold, with the right draw, could become very interesting in the Derby. Now, I'm I'm not a big Chad Brown going long on the turf guy. We've talked about or on the dirt guy. We've talked about this before. So it would be hard for me to get really excited about Tuscan Gold. But 
uh, the trip that Tuscan Gold could conceivably work out in the Derby is a much better trip than the horses that we have talked about as of yet because of that early speed. And I think some of that early speed wasn't on display today or Saturday again uh, because of the, the the post and because of the jostling. I mean, the, the 11 post made, was made even more tough because you knew track fan was going to clear. So all of a sudden, you know, track fan is going to be in front of you. How do you adjust to that? You know, you're going to get banged inside a little bit. You don't want to try and push track Phantom and get over to the rail because then you can use way too much horse early. So I, I thought the draw was it just even more difficult because of the nuance of track Phantom right to the outside. Uh, Tuscan Gold right now is uh, he sits 18th. He's tied for 16th, but based off of purses and all that stuff, he is 18th in the Kentucky Derby points races. And right now the horses that are tied with him, just to touch Ladombro and Stronghold are all expected to run in 100 point preps this weekend or next weekend. So he's if he wants to go there, he's going to have to go to the Lexington. And I don't think Chad Brown's going to rush this horse. What do you think about this being Chad Brown's Preakness horse? I had that thought immediately after the race. He's slowly, slowly bringing him along in the sense that he was a little slow to the track and to get that win. But yeah, Curtis Miller brings it up right there. Tuscan Gold for the Preakness. Um, if he doesn't make the, the Derby gate, I would be shocked if he's not there. Because it, it also makes sense with the distance. Um, and, and we generally, you're going to get a little bit lighter field, which I think would favor Tuscan Gold. I think he'd be better in a 12 horse field than a 20 horse field. Um, and you usually, I mean, what we've seen like eight to 10 the last couple of years in the Preakness. So if you're running that mm -hmm. eight to 10 range and you also get a little bit more time to recuperate, I, I do think Tuscan Gold fits that pretty well. And you, as of right now, I wouldn't expect Nysos comes back around in time for the Preakness. If you told me no. Nysos is no longer in the Preakness, if I'm Tuscan Gold's owners, I've got like, guys, we're going to the Preakness. <laughs> we don't have a good chance in the Derby. Let's go to the Preakness. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. I mean, Nysos obviously uh, back on the farm a little bit. So I would be very surprised if Nysos ends up in the Preakness. And, and it, yeah. the market got as low as, as I, thought, I thought I saw eight to five out there on Nysos to win the Preakness at one point. And it looks like he's not going to even oh. be running in the race. So that's, uh, that's a oh, tough one. If you took a little, if little I don't take short prices. Pieces. Yeah, well, that's the problem with it. They need to make the gate like that. They got to get there first. And and honestly, like eight to five, let's say it goes off at six to five, but you get to bet them on the day of instead of two months before. Uh, there's a lot of value in taking the six to five versus eight to five. If you actually like them. Right. And so what I do with the future, I just throw five bucks out there on longer shots that I think have a legit chance. And that's I'll leave it at that. And I, I think, OK, if uh, catching freedom was one of them. I was like, if he wins. He's not going to be anywhere close. I've got one on Liberal Arts who's in the Arkansas Derby. If he wins or is a nice second, he's going to be a hell of a lot better than the prices that I got him on uh, that race as well. Last race, we'll talk about the fourth place finisher track fandom. My concern coming into this race was the distance. I think we saw he, he got things his own way out there. He still just didn't get that distance. Yeah, he didn't. Um, I actually thought he held on pretty well, all things considered. Um, but if you look at like Common Defense, who was the horse pressing, he held on right behind him, though. So you you kind of like, well, was it really that good? If if we're not even anywhere interested in Common Defense, but Common Defense was as good as Track Phantom, essentially, in this race, um, how, how does that make you feel about Track Phantom? He will be part of the Derby pace. He does have enough points to get in. I would expect him to go to the Derby. Um, yeah. But I, I this is one of those where you, you know him early and forget him late. Uh, final comment I'll bring up here from, uh, from Curtis Manlow. He says, uh, he didn't fade that bad at a mile and three sixteenths. I agree. It wasn't that bad, but didn't give me any desire. He go to see him in the Derby unless he's going to just be a pace factor. Seventh well, place does not pay pretty well in the Kentucky Derby. Do you know what seventh place pays for, uh, in the Kentucky Derby? I think it's zero, right? Isn't it the top six that get paid? Top five get paid, right, okay. and that's it. If you finish sixth in the Kentucky Derby and you miss fifth by a nose, you missed <laughs> a paycheck by now, a nose. Yeah. What if Track Phantom draws the four? I mean, because could you make a case that the, the post position the last two races have inhibited Track Phantom's ability to get the distances? Yeah, that's a good... Well, they haven't helped him, that's for sure. You did see him have to get used just to get that early position from those far outside posts. He's interesting because... It... It helps the closers. I want to see these closers do well in the Derby. Track Phantom's a horse I want to go there because I know he'll set up for – horses are going to get tired chasing him. Track Phantom might fade to fourth. The horses that chase him are going to be well behind. Yeah, to be fair, I'm playing devil's advocate. I don't like Track Phantom even if he draws the four, <laughs> but I do think that at least it has to at least be discussed because the posts in these two races have not been his friend. So we'll see what happens. Silver Charm, I'd run Tuscan Gold in the Derby and Track Phantom to the Preakness. Uh, track, uh, Preakness, mile three sixteenths, and definitely much fewer horses, like we said, will be chasing him there. But uh, listen, this I saw the Louisiana Derby lived up to the hype. 
we were very excited about this one. Uh, we both nailed catching freedom on there. Maybe if we both had single catching freedom, we could have hit the Bayou Bluegrass pick five. But uh, catching freedom wins Louisiana Derby. Another race we covered on the Bayou Bluegrass five was over at Turfway Park, the grade three Jeff Ruby stakes. Now, this one went to a favorite that won like a freight train in the freight in the uh, front stretch there endlessly wins the Jeff Ruby stakes by four lengths. But trainer Michael McCarthy has already said they're going to go for the American turf. They're not going the derby route. So first off, what did you think of the race? And then also McCarthy's decision. This is a really frustrating race for me. Uh, I don't know if you, I, I've watched you guys live talking about it. I don't know if you saw how bad Triple Espresso's stretch run was, but I had a cold 10 14 exacta and I was pretty oh. furious because you talked about the four and noted and how noted got banged around. Uh, the, the 14 had to check like three times in the stretch and missed by a head to finish second in this race. Uh, Triple Espresso was ran a very, very good race. I would expect Triple Espresso comes back on grass. That's when I've tagged where I think that this horse, considering the post and everything else that went wrong, ran a lot better than expected. We'll see what happens uh, with, with that horse coming back. I do expect to be on turf. I think this is the right move by Mike McCarthy. Look, Endlessly is bred for turf, uh, has run on turf exclusively as a two-year-old, stepped up to the three-year-old class, ran a Golden Gate over the synthetic, ran well there, another synthetic race here, not really bred for the dirt. I, to me, it makes uh, this is one of the reasons why I love and hate the Jeff Ruby Stakes. It's a it's a nice prep race to have. There's a big purse. It allows some horses that that have th some synthetic uh, pedigree to be able to try and make their way to the Derby that direction. I like that. But at the same time, uh, it doesn't make any sense for a horse like Endlessly to go on. However, you do get some of these nicer turf horses that get out there and run here, and you get to see some. Okay, what is the dirt horse versus the turf horse, and how do they kind of uh, how do they how do they line up? I thought Endlessly was great here. Uh, it looked like Endlessly was going to do nothing about the half mile point and then really kind of picked it up, found a way. I thought Rispoli did a great job of, of pulling, I guess, an Irad or a Paco and bumping his bumping his <laughs> way out to get around the turn. And once he got open, I mean, Endlessly just kind of cruised because he he went up when he was asked and moved from seventh to, to fourth in the blink of an eye and just needed room to be the best horse there. So uh, I thought Endlessly was really good. I I'm, think McCarthy did the right thing, not sending the horse uh, to the Derby and We'll see what else comes out of here. I this I look down the list and I'm like I'm not really excited about any of these horses in the Derby. <laughs> I think a couple of them have a better turf future than they do dirt future, um, and so I would be surprised. Like West Saratoga probably ends up going to the Derby just because why wouldn't you at this point? Um, but I, you know, I, I thought Endlessly ran well, and I'm I'm upset Triple Espresso didn't get second. Uh, I'm upset that. I did, by the way, that stretch run, uh, I forgot the triple espresso was the initial horse that Woodcourt banged into. Woodcourt was just a freaking All mess. All over the place, seven. yeah. Smashed into triple espresso and then came down and turned noted sideways. Like, that was, like, I saw it on air and I was like, ah, like, hold on. I saw the whole entire four saddle cloth. I'm not supposed to see that like that. Uh, luck, everybody is okay. I am, I am sad that Seize the Gray missed second by a head because... I mean, yeah, okay, sure, it'd be nice to have Dwayne Lucas in there. That horse was six to one, uh, was that close to being the second choice in the race. And it's because of the My Racehorse factor. And it's good for the sport, for the My Racehorse people to be at the Derby and all that. The takeout for Seize the Gray, like, that's just free take. Yeah, it really. <laughs> takeout is. reducer for us. So well, sad that he didn't make it and sad the coach didn't get to go. Yeah. Do we, I mean, Seize the Gray gets what, 20 points for this, though? Yeah, but he's sitting. Where is he sitting? See if I can find him. He's well, actually, I take it back. He's sitting 15th. So he's got yeah. 27 points. He needs to finish top 18 to assume that the Japanese and uh, European horses don't take him out. Right. But like endlessly is not going to go. That's one already in the That's top. True. Like, so there, I think there are going to be a couple defections that we see as well from the points list. And, and you would assume Baffert horses are going to take the Santa Anita Derby points, which means that all of a sudden you don't have the California contingent. So I, I do think there is a world here where sees the grace still makes it in the gate, or at least is an AE heading into the Derby. I uh, definitely don't rule out the Lexington. The, the coach yeah. after sees the grave won his three-year-old debut seasonal debut. He said, all right, we're looking at possibly, the stakes that was just run, the hot spring stakes, which was just run at Oaklawn on Saturday as well, but not for points. He said, we're either going to do that in the Lexington or something else in the Lexington. And I'm like, you just got this horse back and you're like, we're going to run him two more times for the Kentucky. God bless the coach. Let's go, baby. Let's roll.
<laughs> uh, speaking of the, uh, yeah, I, I, sorry, endlessly. I think that that's the right decision. I saw someone else bring. There's so many huge three-year-old turf races, both in New York, and then if he proves on American Turf Day or in the American Turf, rather, he doesn't belong with the Kentucky East Coast horses. Del Mar's got some great turf races that I'm sure Mike McCarthy would love to win as well. So. Uh, yeah, uh, endlessly going to the turf. That is the right thing. And great to see that they're not going derby crazy. So let's take a look at the Kentucky Derby points uh, standings as is right now. Catchy Freedom at the top. Endlessly, you can scratch him off because they said that he's not going to go. Trek Phantom, I would assume until we hear otherwise that he goes. West Saratoga gets in. Uh, it's a cool story. I don't know if I have anything to do with the horse for the derby. Timberlake, Honor Marie, Dornox, Messy Products, Sierra Leone. Deterministic, uh, they're all in this field. Right now, I kind of going through, Mike, how many points do you think it ends up taking for someone to make the Derby Gate this year? I mean, I think that 25-point range is right where you need to be if you think about scratches. Because you're going to have a couple horses that pop above those that are 25 points, but then you're going to have horses that defect out of the field as well. Um, so I, I think if you're anywhere from that 20 to 25 points range, you got a legitimate shot of being able to get in via scratches and defections. But I don't think you're going to get in with less than 20 this year. Uh, Agate Road, maybe he should have stayed at uh, Turfway for the Jeff Derby. Maybe. <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot that you were a thing that happened at one point. Uh, probably nobody that's this far down, unless they're going to need to win or get second in a Derby prep. I was a little surprised we haven't seen resilience, but I guess that's the danger of thinking a Bill Mott horse is going to be pushed because it, it absolutely will not be. Yeah, we've learned that the hard way. Uh, a couple of Oaks preps to talk about. We'll go back to Fairgrounds for race 11 from this past Saturday. It was a great two fairgrounds. Oaks, Tarifa, three to two favorite, ends up getting the job done. No surprise there. Both headers are top pick. What I hated is that Intricate just had absolutely nothing in the stretch. But let's talk about Tarifa and then the runner up, Our Pretty Woman. Mike, what'd you think? I thought this was a phenomenal race by both of them. Um, Tarifa, especially. I, I, Okay, it's looked, you look on paper and you're like, oh, it's a really good trip. The stock too wide, was able to go by. Like, Tarifa had trouble in the first turn, if you watch it. Like, Tarifa, like, our pretty woman cleared over and it caused Tarifa to check. And then Tarifa was a little bit rank after getting passed down the back stretch. It looked like there wasn't going to be a ton left in the turn. And Pratt started asking, and our pretty woman was still pretty chilly. But Tarifa really dug in and was able to win. I thought that was a, a phenomenal race by Tarifa. And our pretty woman, like, Rosario, for some reason, didn't stone cold send and almost caused a world of trouble for our pretty woman by being stuck three wide on the first turn. Uh, he was able to clear after causing problems for both. I think it was a two and the five um, who were the inside of him. Uh, but our pretty woman dug in exceptionally well, too. This was a great horse race between these two coming down to the wire. And I, I enjoyed this one. We talked about playing cold exact is here. The cold five, seven ends up paying 1190, which I thought was a phenomenal price for those two. But uh, Tarifa is your favorite in the Oaks, right? I think we can agree on that. Yeah, at this point, I really don't think anybody's going to knock her off. That it's that by far the best thing that we've seen that wasn't in California. Of course, we know that Baffert can't make it there. I agree with you that these two were really incredible, and it was a great battle in the stretch. Our pretty woman did get the breather on the backside, but she still had to fight. She still had to hold Tarifa back. I said on the live show right after this race was done, I said, I think we saw the Kentucky Oaks favorite just beat the Alabama Stakes winner. I think our pretty woman, with her progression, you put her at a mile and a quarter for the Alabama at Saratoga in the summer. Tell me another uh, Philly that's going to be able to do that in this group other than possibly Tarifa. So I think that uh, superstar horses, both of them. Yeah, and our pretty woman would be dangerous going the mile and a quarter as well. Magladoro on top, Spitestown on the bottom. So a horse that uh, should get better with the distance. And, and it's taken a step forward um, in each of her races now as well. It was good to see her do it over a fast track too. The first two races, both over a sloppy track. And you think about the Alabama, you don't generally think of it as a uh, a ton of speed signed on. We've seen short fields in that race the last couple of years. So her being able to control the pace would probably be a very big advantage there as well. If you're Brendan Walsh, do you bring Intricate back to the uh, uh, for the Kentucky Oaks? I think she gets the points, but it's I mean, not I, a good effort. That's a question for you more than me. I haven't been as high on Intricate as you have throughout this this two race fairgrounds uh, streams that we have done. I've been I've been lower on Intricate. I had Intricate in third in this race. I, I thought our pretty women Tarafa were pretty significantly ahead of those the rest of the field. Do you bring Intricate back because you you were more on the hype train on the Intricate side? Uh, if she came out of this, well, yes, but it's hard. It's a lot harder for me to just emphatically say that. Uh, the reason I say yes is because early in this race, I noticed Tyler Gaffleyon put her into it, realized kind of what the pace situation was, 
And maybe just her running close to the pace, she didn't have that kick when she comes from off of it. She needs a big field. Wherever she goes next, it needs to be a big field because she doesn't like to run up close. She likes to be farther back and, and pass horses. So, so now I would, but it's it's very hard for me to emphatically say that. So she was the favorite against Tarafa in the Rachel Alexander. She was a close second choice against Tarafa mm-hmm. here. She'll be 20 to 1 in the uh, Oaks if she goes. 18 she'll to 1? She'll be 10 to 1. She, she, there are a lot of bad feelings that are going to be in the Oaks. So she'll be 10 to 1. Okay, would, you, would, would the price in a 10-horse field, would the price make you interested again? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so imagine not off not the hype the train. Favorite. You're as still as on she, the hype train then. I'm still on the hype train, yeah. Okay. And, and listen, I, if that doesn't work, we got the Iowa Oaks we can aim for as well. I, I think I think Nick might be right. I think you're looking at 15, 20 to 1 on her after these last two races and the way that Tarafa has absolutely waxed her. Uh, this is what I'm looking forward to seeing again is Impel. That, or that filly has got uh, some super speed. Uh, one more filly to talk about here that qualified for the Kentucky Oaks. Turfway Park Race 11, the Bourbonette Oaks, the Mountain 16th on the synthetic. We were all over Everland, your winner at 11 to 1. Um, I had the top two finishes. I went three deep. The top two finishes were on my ticket, and so was the two to one favor to finish last. Uh, <laughs> that one, uh, yeah, listen, that happens. morning line, he was six to one on the morning line, but I was surprised she went off as the favorite. Anyways, Everland, we both saw this coming. Why? Well, it was a horse that was just trending in the right direction. When you go back and you you look at the past performances, it made a ton of sense that that Everland would run big here. And I don't even think this, and this is one of the reasons what you were talking about, do we want to talk about the Oaks preps or not? I wanted to talk about Everland. Um, it, this is another one where if you go back and you watch the replay, Everland got a brutal, brutal trip in this spot. Now you think, oh, well, Everland got to run up the rail. The trip was really good. Everland didn't get to even get started before they made it to the stretch because because of the speed in front of her and the lack of anywhere to run. So if you watch the horses that like Winnable got the jump, if you watch like the five and the nine who were making this wide move, they got to go by Everland and then Everland had to re-rally after they already went past her around that far turn. Same with Alpine Princess. And yes, she saved ground on the turn, but she didn't really get to run the majority of this race. I think she wins by far more than a length and a quarter had she been able to run the entire race. I think the time would have been better. I think the buyer would have been better. Uh, and I thought the turn of foot was was impressive when she was able to get the room as well. Uh, this is a horse where you look and you're like, can she run on the dirt? Look, it's arrogant out of a tap at mare. Why couldn't she run on the dirt, right? Now, she's never tried it. Uh, debuted at Kentucky Downs, is run on synthetic every single start outside of that. Um, but, I, like... I think I think I'm I'm an Everland fan after watching this race. Like I think she's a legit threat in the Kentucky Oaks if they end up sending her there. She looked good in this one, and it she had the pace to she had a pace setter in Maxi Superfly who didn't get things easy the whole way, and so I think that that's you know that was a big help for her too. But you're going to have a lot of speed in the Kentucky Oaks that doesn't finish. That's just how that 14 horse field draws all the time. So. A definitely a good spot for her. I, I'm with you. At, uh, yeah, Erga with a tap at eleven to one. We we loved it too. Mm-hmm. Uh, how about okay? Before I move on, does Abel get to keep them out? I say yes. Uh, Eric Foster showed with Rich Strike he's going to bring Sunny Leone along. Yeah, I don't see why you wouldn't at this point. Like, what's what's the point of switching switching jockeys here? I, I think you you end up with with Abel and, and obviously Abel very good there at Turfway Park. He's done exceptional since moving over from California to the Kentucky Circuit and specifically at Turfway. And uh, I I don't see why you'd make the move now, especially with the way he rode this horse and the fact that he's got experience over the horse, which I, I do think matters, especially when you get to the bigger field. So I would hope Abel uh, Abel stays on board. And it's a heck of a claim. I mean, this horse was claimed for what was it twenty thousand thirty thousand dollars off Jonathan Thomas three back. And won the next race out. I had some trick trouble and, and ended up running fourth uh, in the Cincinnati Trophy and then came back and, and obviously wins this race here. So she's improved in all three races with Eric Foster here. I, I like I was surprised to think I thought I was surprised that I thought a legitimate Oaks threat came out of this race because I was not expecting that. What about the number two winnable? She was uh, she got the exact trip that I was hoping for was sit right behind the four and the eight. And she had the lead at one point, but the 10 just, you know, ended up running her down. But Winnable was making her second career start. <laughs> That's it. And now she's got the points to make the Kentucky Oaks. And this is another one breeding wise by Justify out of a Curlin mare. Why couldn't she run on dirt? Do you like her at all for the Kentucky Oaks? I think she's interesting. Um, if you go back and you watch the race, she was very green early. She was pulling. She didn't like she, she wasn't. We talked about how like 
with um uh man what's the horse i can't think of the horse's name anyway we talked about how some of these horses are green early in their career she clearly hasn't gotten everything figured out in the head yet and if she could figure that out she would have been able to help hold the distance um hold the distance better than she did because she clearly struggled at the end of this race once she took the lead she was gassed she was just done but she used a lot of that energy early i'm not sure she can win the race but she is one of those horses where if you get the right price i want her in the third or fourth spot one other horse i want to at least mention to moving on up the five horse who i used and i liked quite a bit in this race uh this is a race where i would I'm interested in moving on up coming out of this race because this horse broke terribly. I thought made a pretty good move around the back stretch and just flattened out once they got into the turn after having a really wide trip and breaking absolutely terribly. So moving on up, I think is an interesting horse coming back out of this. I do think winnable has a shot at hitting the board in the Oaks. Um, I'm not, I, I, it would be a big step forward to be able to win it. I, if she was loan speed, I think then you could talk about winnable as a, a serious Oaks contender. I don't think she will be though. I agree. There's like I just said, there's a lot of cheap speed that signs up for that race. Uh, we'll quickly look at the Kentucky Oaks leaderboard here. Tarifa on top. Jody's Pride, we still oh wait, no, she came back and she won. Uh she'll be back in the aqueduct race, which is the gazelle, I mm -hmm. think. Yep, I, the none of those ones at Aqueduct matter, but I think it's the gazelle. Uh, Fiona's magic, we saw her do well. Everland's on the board now at fourth. Lemon Muffin returns this weekend. Uh, you see our pretty woman we just talked about on the the board intricate right now is sitting eight. So if they want to go, she'll be, she's yeah, going to make in. it. Yeah. She's in if they want to go with her. Uh, but looking at the Kentucky Oaks board, who is your pick right now for this race? I mean, it's, it's Tarifa, Tarafa, whatever you want. How you want to say, I, I say Tarifa, you say Tarafa, I think, uh, I, I like Tarifa more than anybody else. I thought she's been really impressive. I've been on this horse for two straight races as well. Like this has been yeah. one of those where, you kind of are just enjoying the ride at this point because it's hard to say, okay, I'm going to get off the horse I've selected in two straight races where she looked really good in both of them and won impressively and uh, clearly getting better as well. I mean, that's the other part. Like the, she's not run a ton. This was her fifth race. Uh, this was only her second graded stakes race. And the last race, I thought she got better. And this one, she took just another step forward. Um, and, and so it's hard to really go against her. She's got the high buyer in the class with a 95. She's got improved every single race. Like to me, she's a legitimate favorite in this spot. Uh, you, you've got Impel, who I believe is targeting the Ashland stakes for Brad Cox. She has no points right now, but she's perfect in two starts. So she's kind of an all or nothing thing. But you could have a situation where Brad Cox has Tarifa and he has Impel, assuming she wins the, the Ashland stakes at Keeneland. And then last year we had wet paint and botanical for Brad Cox. So two more fillies that are coming from uh, different locations, but uh, could absolutely run wild or at least be short favorites for the Kentucky Oaks. Uh, Leslie's Rose last we saw was gassed finishing, I think fourth in the Devona Dale. Which yeah. She hasn't done well in a while. That Rose has not bloomed. No, there, there you go. <laughs> uh, Christmas is maybe nine horses in the Oaks. They'll have 14. There's just I bet, I bet they get season. a full field. I bet there's some yeah. shots fired here. Yeah, that one. Uh, Copian, that's a Mandela horse, but she's going to have to try and beat Kinza in the San Anita Oaks and, or at least get enough points to go. And Mandela's not aggressive. Like mm -hmm. Bill Mott looks aggressive compared to, to Richard, Richard Mandela. Yep. I agree. We'll see what happens. I, I, and Pell's going to be interesting. And it, like, sh if she's in the race too, it injects even more speed in that spot too. So we'll see what she's able to do if she makes it. Because we, do, like you mentioned, there's some cheap speed in the Oaks, and so that it makes Tarafa's trip a little bit more difficult. It, it plays out for a horse. Um, uh, it, it plays out for horses that are coming off the pace, like Everland. Like, so it, we'll see what happens in this Kentucky Oaks. But it, it's going to be. I'm more excited about the Derby today than I was on Friday. Let's put it that way. And I'm more excited about the Oaks today than I was on Friday. So for me, that checks the box of a good weekend from a horse racing perspective. I don't have any horses I wanted to come on here and just poo-poo on. I wanted to talk about positives that I saw this weekend. So it's it's always nice when you're walking in there and you talk about the positives. Right now, who's your Derby pick, Magic? Derby pick right now, I'm going to be on Catching Freedom. I was that impressed with it. Yep. I'm sticking with Forever Young. I'm still saying the Japanese horse comes over and gets her done. The uh, yeah, Shadi's forever mine. She loves that one as well. I I think that's a listen. I'm not. I have no reason not to say forever young. Like he's going to have to do poorly in UAE Derby for me to try and uh, rip him apart. Hey ho says liberal arts. That's I'd be okay with that. Shadi'd be okay with that. I know. Yeah, <laughs> but, we, we we got time to change our minds. Don't worry. But yeah, like yeah. at this point. 
I still don't see the stalker that I want. I still see all these closers that I think are the best horses in the class. And that to me is a, a very, very scary thing. Well, tell us who you've got there. See, Ana Maria, see Sierra Leone. That's another good one as well, especially if he wins the bluegrass. You're going to probably be looking at the favorite there. So let us know what you have for your picks for the Derby and the Oaks down in the comments section. Thanks for joining us for this Magic Mike Show episode talking about Derby Prep recaps. Head over to RacingDudes.com. The Kentucky Derby update from Aaron discussing it more in depth, the uh, races from this past week, as well as early looks at the Florida Derby and Arkansas Derby. If you want even closer looks at those races, we have the full previews for you as well on the website and at youtube.com slash racing dudes. Also, Aaron did a pre uh, preview for the Dubai World Cup. We've got the return of Senior Buscador and Ushba Tesoro. That's going to be exciting, if not way too early in the day for me in the morning. But that's okay. You can go check out the preview for that as well. And we didn't do a preview for it, but the UAE Derby, it does have Forever Young. So uh, be tuning in for that one. And we will be back next Monday to talk about all those things. Thursday, would you rather go to Gulfstream or would you rather go to Oaklawn? Mm. I mean, it's Florida Derby Day. We got to go to Gulfstream. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, fine. You know, you know where my where my loyalties lie when we talk about Gulfstream versus Oakland. Look, if Oakland's on the turf, we can go to Oakland. Okay. All right. We'll have to make that decision Thursday morning, but yeah, we're probably we'll leaning Gulfstream. Hot spring. Yeah. <laughs> Join us uh, this Thursday at five Eastern, two Pacific, live, or make sure you catch the replay. You can download and get where you get your podcast. And Mike, as far as March Madness went, how did you do this past weekend? Uh, it's funny. So March Madness was pretty good for me. Well, actually, it was very good on Saturday and Sunday. Friday, Thursday and Friday was very choppy. But Saturday and Sunday, that was very good. Um, but we're doing a new Pucks and Ponies segment on uh, on the handle. So the show that, that I host for VEASAN every 9 to noon uh, Pacific on Saturday and Sunday. One of the 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 second hour, the last segment. So it was at uh, 11, 10.45 Pacific, 1.45 Eastern. I get to talk about my two favorite horses of the day, and I get to talk about the hockey games I like for the day. Uh, good weekend for that segment. We'll put it that way. We had the the thirteen to one winner at Gulfstream yesterday in the eighth. We had the two to one winner in the ninth. The double paid forty one to one, so that was kind of fun. We had endlessly in there. We had the Tarafa exacta in there, so eleven dollar exacta or twelve dollar exacta, and the hockey went four and two with two plus money winners. So uh, that was enjoyable as well. So make sure you're checking out Veasan over there. The handle uh, I'll have that segment every Saturday and Sunday if you want the best horses I like from both of those days. Make sure you also join us here on the YouTube channel uh, every Thursday through Sunday for Dudes Who Bet Daily, noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. We preview the, each of the biggest basketball games that day before giving our best bets. And uh, it's been an up and down season. We were super hot in January. February was harsh, and we're trying to even back out in March. But we'd love to see. It's a lot of fun over there. And like I mentioned, we'll be back here 5 Eastern, 2 Pacific on Thursday. Until that time, follow us on Twitter. I'm at Curtis Kellowart. He's at Summer Bomb 18, number one, number eight. Corporate Overlords at Racing underscore Dudes. Until Thursday, I'm Magic. And a mic. Good luck this week. The Magic Mike Show. Where you hear the experts speak. The Magic Mike Show. Tune into the show every week. The Magic Mike Show. You can trust the show is the bomb because it's being brought to you by RacingDudes.com.